If the numbers may be good on one day, it's because they weren't as bad as the numbers the day before. An update on Arkansas amid the pandemic. Are the state's health care providers coping? And if the caseload continues to rise, is Arkansas prepared? A legislative session approaches, and the governor outlines his budget. Are the lower levies he proposes prudent, overdue, or unduly generous? Both sides coming up on Arkansas Week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us. Politics and policy unceasing. And just around the corner is the General Assembly's meeting, the last regular session for Governor Hutchinson. And the budget he unveiled this week has some advocates and some opposition. In a few minutes, we'll talk it over with two legislative leaders. But first, the seemingly unceasing spread of coronavirus in Arkansas and elsewhere, where it is taking our state and what to do about it. We're joined by two physicians on the front line. Dr. Jose Romero is Arkansas's Secretary of Health, and Dr. Joe Thompson leads the Arkansas Center for health improvement. Dr. Romero, we'll begin with you. Uh, the latest estimates or projections anyway, models from the uh, Bozeman College of Public Health seem rather forbidding. Is the, in all fair, is the term crisis fair? Is it too early to use that term? I think it is too early to use the term. Um, we are dealing with this as, as it is evolving. We know it is progressing, uh, but I would not say it is a crisis at this time. How close are we? I think it, it's going to depend on how we react over the next few weeks to uh, these growing number of cases. Um, we have seen an increase in cases, and I believe the vast majority of these cases are a result of uh, the past ha Halloween holiday, where um, I think our Kansas have uh, relaxed their, their vigilance and, and their um, adherence to the three W's, you know, washing your hands, wearing a mask, and watching your distance. Um, but it, it is something that we can bring under control, um, and it's, uh, I don't think it's too late to, have, to do so or to begin to actually uh, uh, reinstitute all of these things again, in, in particular in, in prelude to the, to the Thanksgiving holiday. Well, uh, uh, not to press too much, but the Bozeman models seem to suggest that the worst is yet to come. Do you concur? Yes, I mean, they, and they have from the very beginning. I mean, the, the model has always predicted that there will be a peak somewhere in the future. What's important to realize about that model is that it has continuously modified when that peak will occur. Uh, it was supposed to have occurred by now, uh, that, that when the early projections came out, but it has now have been moved outward uh, to March of next year. Dr. Thompson, I believe you have some fresh numbers that you can report, and your organization, of course, monitors school districts, zip codes, other demographic data, geographic well, we're providing some analytic surge capacity to the health department, and I would concur with Secretary Romero that, that our future is in our control. I would go a little farther. I think it's time to sound alarm bells. Uh, we have moved from hundreds of new cases per day to thousands of new cases per day just in the last two weeks. We have seen the number of red school districts quintuple. We had about 13 red school districts five weeks ago. We have 48 uh, now red and purple school districts. These are the proportion of new infections in the school districts from which our children and our teachers and our school personnel come from. We have some zip codes in the state that have more than 3% of the residents that have been newly infected in the last two weeks. So while I think it is in our control, we are not in control of the spread of this virus right now. And our numbers within this state, as well as the numbers in states around us and across the nation, uh, pretend for some very dire circumstances unless actions are not taken soon. Yeah, Dr. Thompson, if you would take just a moment and explain what we mean now by red and purple. Red are what we would call that a hot zone. We get the data from the health department and we geocode the new positive cases into school district boundaries so that we can actually 
communicate on a regular basis with the superintendents, the Department of Education, the Department of Health, where a hot zone may be emerging. We track this over time. And we have seen the number of red zone school districts, that is school districts with more than 1% of the residents newly infected, move from where we had around 12 school districts at the 1st of October to now we have more than 48 school districts that are in that red zone, zone here in the 1st of November. And I concur with Secretary Romero. It, a lot of this has happened in the last two weeks since the Halloween period, but the spread and the exposure is continuing to grow. It's not a static situation. We're having more and more people, as reported by the health department each day, infected. All right, Dr. Thompson, at first blush, the, the, the figure 3% that you, the infection level that you reported, that would seem to the layman to be rather small. To an epidemiologist or a physician, uh, it's rather more forbidding, is it not? Well, this is the zip code in and around Mark Tree, a rural community that early in the process had very few infections and very minimal exposure. So I think our rural communities, where we see much of this spread now, has had more lax uh, uh, protections in place. And it's a place we really need our local mayors, police chiefs, business leaders to step forward and reinforce the importance of wearing masks. Well, let me go back to, and to, to both uh, physicians here. The, the data that I'm looking at seems to suggest that the, if there is an exponent, well, certainly the growth in the caseload is coming from those 60 or 61 or 2 and younger and, and not the elderly. Now, maybe age brings wisdom with it or wisdom comes with age, but there also seems to be a sort of bulletproof, do you see a bulletproof mentality taking hold here as, as rarely before? So, Dr. Romero, uh, I, I, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't I don't think it's it's a bulletproof mentality. I think part of the issue is that um, younger populations tend to socialize more, tend to become engaged in social activities, and and these social activities are, are what are, are you, transmitting this virus, and including small family gatherings. I mean, what is the CDC has now pointed out is that family gatherings of ten or less are really the ones that are transmitting this within the community. We know now that there's a recent paper published uh, from, a, from a journal called Nature that indicates that places like um, restaurants, gyms, uh, are sources for transmission of this virus. Um, and so what we're seeing is that uh, as people go about their daily lives and begin to lessen somewhat uh, their, their guard on this virus, we're seeing transmission within the community. Well, comes now the holidays. We have Thanksgiving right around the corner, followed by Yo Ho Ho. Uh, it's going to be a very taxing, challenging time, not only for families, but for the health authorities that are trying to advise them. What is your best advice? Dr. Thompson, we'll start with you. Well, our board yesterday put out some prevention strategies for families, building off of the health department and the CDC guidance, reinforcing their strong guidance that households celebrate the holidays uh, within their household, that we don't mix households, that we use electronic means to connect and to share the thanks and the, and the celebrations that we have. Uh, when people come together from different places, that is a spreading potential. Uh, our board went beyond uh, the health department recognizing that we still have some people that will come together, some people that must come together, students coming home from college and so forth. And so if you put a strategy in place that this weekend, everyone that's coming together needs to have a conversation and agree on how they manage the risk. Starting this weekend for the next 10 days to two weeks, reduce public exposure, cease going to restaurants, bars, shop less frequently, and then potentially to get a PCR molecular test before you travel for the Thanksgiving holidays to make sure that you're not one of the 40 to 50 percent that are infected and spreading the virus but have no symptoms and therefore you do not know that you are a vector bringing the infection into your loved ones and placing them at risk. Dr. Romero, I assume that you're uh, aligned with that advice. I am, and I have publicly stated that um, I think it's, it, that uh, family gatherings should be discouraged this year. In particular, family gatherings that bring individuals from nursing homes or congregate settings into the family. Um, I, I really think this needs to be a very, um, very family-centered, that is a very nuclear family-centered um, holiday. Um, I would not advise travel outside of the state or even within the state during this period of time. Uh, we should stay where we are um, uh, because if we travel to an area that is um, uh, with high incidence, we could bring uh, back to our communities 
uh, infection, or we could take, as Dr. Thompson has pointed out, we could take infection to those sites. Uh, to both doctors, Dr. Romero, we'll stay with you for a moment. Uh, how, how concerned are you about capacity in hospital, uh, hospitals, urban and rural, particularly ICUs and, and those that are in a position to, to uh, ventilate patients? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, we've had uh, very uh, robust discussions about this. At, at this time, our capacity is adequate. I mean, that doesn't mean that it, it can't be exhausted, but uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, although the ICU capacity or the use at this time um, is high, the vast majority of those cases are not related to COVID. Um, uh, the biggest problem we're, we're suffering, I think, if you wish we're suffering, we, we, we have in front of us is the staffing issue. That is, the beds are there, but we need to have personnel that can staff it. And that's because there is a shortage of staff all across the country. We're no different than any other state in that area. But what's, what's the cause of the staff shortage, if I could? Is it an exhaustion over, or just simply absence of personnel? I, part of it's absence of personnel, but it's also that, it, depending on where you're, you're, you're located, um, a, a significant number of your staff may be traveling nurses. And we know that traveling nurses, for example, use this time of year sort of to not renew their, their, their contracts and just to go back home to spend it with their family. So that's part of the issue. Um, Steve, if I could add, you know, talking with ICU physicians, pulmonologists, others uh, across the state, I think the concern by the frontline medical personnel is much higher than has been articulated. They are feeling the demand and the push of new COVID patients on top of existing intensive care patients, heart attacks, strokes, you know, people with cancer that have had uh, surgery that need those beds also. And it's not the number of beds or the number of ventilators, but as Secretary Romero has alluded, it's the staff. If you've got a COVID patient on a ventilator, it's a nurse and a respiratory therapist and a physician support 24 hours a day, seven days a week, week on, week off for an extended period of time. And unfortunately, where we are today nationwide, unlike where we were last spring when the hotspots were in the concentrated areas of New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, the whole nation is undergoing this incredible burden. Utah is considering rationing care. El Paso, the Air Force has had to fly in personnel. We had a report this morning where a, a Missouri hospital couldn't transfer a patient with a brain tumor. Um, our system is getting tight because the personnel is getting worn out and or impacted by COVID exposure itself. I think we're much closer to a tipping point and, and I would strongly recommend that Secretary Romero and the governor you know, be talking about uh, more extreme strategies. I think there are mayors that should immediately start thinking about reinstating curfews, particularly if they have a high infection rate over the last two weeks. Uh, and I think every family should do everything they can to minimize the potential of spreading COVID-19 as increasingly we're indoors and going into the holiday season. Well, Dr. Thompson, I'm bound to say you seem a little bit less sanguine, if that's the term, than, than your colleague, uh, Dr. Romero here. When you I'm close to the, t go ahead. I, I am concerned here. I, I think, you know, our hospital situation is adequate, as Dr. Romero said, but stressed. And stress cannot be maintained over time. And every direction of every indicator I see is going in the wrong direction. We have all of our trauma systems that are having more and more hospitalizations. Therefore, they can't help each other in the way that they have in the past. We have the Northeastern Hospital CEOs coming out two weeks ago with caution and warning and a request from their constituency. We had the Northwestern Hospitals come out this week. Uh, I, think, I think we are closer to a tipping point than some may want to acknowledge. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Romero, the governor yesterday seemed to acknowledge that a, a recommendation by you and your staff some weeks ago that a 28 week, or excuse me, a 28 day shutdown was definitely in order, commercial and, and really essentially gatherings of all kinds, bars, restaurants, commercial establishment. A, is that correct? And B, are, are, are you and the governor on the same page now? Um, so let me, let me clarify that. We did not make a recommendation to the governor. What we did was provided him with a series of options that he could consider. So uh, I think that, that that document that everyone is referring to is being mischaracterized. So um, we have provided a, a number of, of, of options. Among them was this option uh, to, to, to 
that, that you have discussed. Um, and I think that uh, we will continue to discuss what options are, are available. Certainly, it is, it is uh, you know, up to him to make that decision. We have provided him with a number of possibilities uh, uh, to go forward with. Now, I think Dr. Thompson is correct that we could be approaching a tipping point, but that tipping point really, I think, is this issue of the holiday that's coming up, the Thanksgiving holiday. And to me, that is a very important uh, uh, point because if we engage in um, activities, again, which I have spoken about and which Dr. Thompson has spoken about, that will spread the virus within our community, we could accelerate the number of cases that we're going to see. We still can bring this under control, and that's what I, what I want people to understand. We have not reached a point of no return. Well, to avoid that point of no return, are, would you advocate to the governor tougher measures than he has thus far been prepared to undertake? I, I think we need to see where the trends are going in the next 24 to 48 hours, and, and we will discuss this as information comes forward. All right, sir. Gentlemen, both Steve. of you, thank you very much. Doctors, thank you both very much for being with us. Thank you, sir. And we'll be right back. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. The legislature is coming back to town. It never truly leaves or never completely leaves. Anyway, this past week, uh, Governor Hutchinson unveiled his budget proposal for the coming fiscal year. And here to kick that around, the Speaker of the Arkansas House of Representatives, the Honorable Matt Shepard of El Dorado, Republican of El Dorado and Senator Keith Ingram. Uh, Democrat is the uh, minority leader of his chamber, Mr. Ingram, of course, from West Memphis. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on board. Mr. Speaker, we'll begin with you. Your first impressions on the governor's agenda. Well, I think that it's uh, a measured agenda at this point. Um, you know, we had the opportunity to hear directly from the governor on Tuesday. And uh, now, you know, getting a lot of feedback from members of the legislature and, you know, I've tried to remind people this is just how the process works, that the governor uh, traditionally, uh, you know, every two years lays out the, his thoughts and priorities. And, and, of course, the legislature will, will have a role to be played as we move into session. Uh, but I think that there, you know, the, a lot of what we see are, are kind of continuations of, of what the governor has focused on over the past six years. So right. I don't know that there's a lot of surprise, uh, but you know, in this environment, uh, there's gonna have to be a lot of discussion as we move forward and, and we're headed towards a session in January. Well, I was gonna ask Mr. Speaker, what were those first impressions, the feedback that you're getting from your members? Uh, you know, I think the thing that probably is generating the most talk was the proposal on uh, the reduced rate for uh, individuals that move into the state. Uh, you know, in all honesty, I think that there's a bit of skepticism there, uh, or at least there's a lot of talk about, you know, is this is this the way we need to go? Uh, you know, proponents would say this is would be a great economic uh, development um, tool to try and attract uh, individuals into the state of Arkansas. Uh, but there's there's a lot of talk, I think, just in terms of is might there be other other options available, and then how do you balance that out against the fact that. Uh, you know, first and foremost, we want to look out for the people of Arkansas. Well, uh, Senator Ingram, your thoughts there. I have to confess, I've been hearing the same thing that the speaker was here in regard to the, the new arrivals. Uh, no question. Uh, I think uh, I, I told the governor when we talked about this before the session, uh, I was going to let him come to Crittenden County and explain uh, to the people that would ask me, now, let's see, I've paid taxes at this rate for the last five years, but somebody that is going to move to the state is going to pay a, a lesser amount. Uh, I think I'm pretty good at explaining things, but I, I, I have a hard time uh, uh, explaining that one. Well, well, let me just throw this out here. Was that a serious proposal or just something that the governor threw in there in your estimation for uh, as something that he could easily surrender? Uh, I, I wouldn't know because I haven't seen the governor really surrender in six years. But uh, I, I think that there was a thought process from what we've been told. Uh, some people on his staff thought that this was a, a potential, a good idea. Uh, I do know that we have to address uh, brain drain in the state. We have a lot of tech people, especially in Northwest Arkansas, that are uh, trained here. They get jobs here. 
and then they're cherry picked out of state uh, at sometimes double the salaries that that they're getting. And and I, I think that is really more of a problem I see than rather trying to bring people into the state. It's 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 holding on to the talent that we have in the state. Well, Senator, do I hear you saying you're not automatically opposed to uh, the administration's phased in approach anyway to, to taking the top rate down? Uh, responsibly, like we did with the sales tax? No, I, I think that we all agree if we can do it responsibly uh, and not cut services. Uh, I, I always caution uh, that when we cut taxes, I, I don't want people to believe that government is fully funded to the level it needs to be. Uh, Pre-K, uh, we're, we're not funding pre-K to the level it needs to be. Uh, early childhood, uh, uh, grades one through three, uh, we know that, that those are the prime learning years for students. And I would like to see us lower the teacher ratio in the classroom uh, to get more personal one-on-one uh, -on -one time with students. Uh, so uh, there are needs that we aren't addressing and to put these tax cuts ahead of those, uh, sometimes we're working at cross purposes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, your thoughts on that, cross purposes? Well, I think that uh, we always have to be mindful of, of you know, what, what do we have as priorities and certainly the governor has, uh, has, you know, I think prioritized reducing the income tax burden on the citizens of the state of Arkansas. And I think that's something that uh, among House members is, is uh, I think there's many House members that, that uh, share that vision as we move forward. But we do always need to keep in mind the services that were provided. One of the things that I think the governor outlined in his budget was following up on the adequacy recommendations from the House and Senate Education Committee is a pretty sizable commitment uh, to education moving forward. Um, but, but as with any session, uh, you know, we're two months out, uh, there'll be a lot of discussion back and forth. And even once we get to session, uh, as you know, there's always a lot of discussion about, you know, wh what, what uh, cuts can we afford from a tax cut perspective? Uh, you know, what, what areas do we need to maybe bolster uh, and put greater emphasis on, and, and that's just part of the legislative process that that I'm confident will will successfully navigate. Would would you anticipate anything in the general assembly, uh, in, particularly in joint budget, to uh, to augment what the governor's proposing for, well, higher ed, uh, well, for uh, pre uh, public schools, higher ed, human services. I think it's always hard to predict what might be filed and what might be offered up, and, and particularly in joint budget, uh, there are a number of members, and so you, we always see various amendments and proposals that are that are put forth. Um, you know, I think that with regard to uh, education and with DHS, there's there's a lot of different opinions on, you know, what's the direction to go and and what kind of uh, what kind of funding levels are appropriate there. So I, I think that you'll certainly see continued discussion on those fronts. I think that as we look at the proposal the governor has has put in front of us, probably the, you know, probably the most discussion would be about the, the various proposals related to tax reduction. And, and then there, he also uh, put forth kind of, a, I guess, a, a kind of a general category for some further tax reduction. And so I think that's where you're gonna see a lot of the, a lot of the discussion as we head towards the session. Yeah, Mr. Ingram, your caucus shrunk, or will come January, uh, by what two members I think, uh, and w and and the entire chamber suddenly do we outsiders seem to shift somewhat to the right. How much? Do, what, what does this portend anyway for the governor's plans for DH, particularly uh, Arkansas Works? Is he going to have a battle over there? Well, you know, we've discussed in budget obviously uh, the impact of. Uh, the Supreme Court decision and what it would mean to Arkansas. Uh, uh, I think that Arkansas works, uh, the private option, whatever you want to call it, is one of the most unique, well thought out pieces of legislation in the country. Uh, we've been able to take advantage of uh, hundreds of millions of federal dollars to provide insurance for those of our working families in Arkansas that quite honestly, health insurance was unaffordable to them. 
So, uh, yes, I mean, we are we obviously we'll wait and see what the Supreme Court decision is. I think the governor uh, and his uh, staff believe that if there is any change in the law, that it, it will allow a, a long runway uh, in order to make the necessary changes. I, I think really uh, back to something the speaker was talking about, the two most interesting things in the governor's budget was one, I'm continually amazed at the income that's coming in, the tax money that we ended up with a surplus for the year during a pandemic. And I think there's a lot of different explanations for that, but I think that's remarkable. I think that in the budget, in order to put money back into a long-term reserve fund is a remarkable thing to be uh, adding savings during uh, uncertain times like this. And then, as the speaker said, the, this is the first time I really remember that uh, the governor has um, put a $50 million uh, allowance, I guess you'd say, or in the budget uh, for further tax cuts. Uh, Senator Joe Jett, or Representative Joe Jett, has a plan to uh, exempt the first uh, 22000 I think it is, from paying income tax, and the price tag on that is about $81 million. And uh, earned income tax credits certainly have been proven to be great investments uh, in states that utilize it uh, as to, to spur economy to get money into the hands of uh, low-income people. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I'll give you the last word, and we're almost out of time, though. Arkansas works, the future, and so much of it does hang on a Got a new legislature, you got a new Supreme Court, too. Well, we'll wait to see what the Supreme Court does. And one of the things that, that we've already already starting to do, it, it, just at least on the House end, I've, I've asked uh, the DHS to begin having discussions with members and hear from members, get their thoughts, uh, and have just an open line of communication. I think that's one of the critical things as we lead into a session is having that type of dialogue and communication because I think that there's information that DHS certainly can provide us, but then I also think there's feedback and information that the members can provide DHS as they uh, approach, you know, the application for new waivers and they look at, uh, you know, substantive legislation that, that likely will be brought this session. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, I want to continue those discussions and hopefully we can find the consensus uh, to find a, you know, find common sense sol uh, solutions that, that, you know, most, if not all, can get behind. Got to end it there, gentlemen, because we are out of time. We thank you for yours. Mr. Speaker, Senator Ingram, thank you. Come back soon. And that's all the time we have for this week's edition. Thank you for joining us. See you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89.